I promise not to say this too much in the weeks ahead because I know it can get old really fast, but I hope you'll humor me if I say it today. We were just there. <laughs> <laughs> Several members of the congregation and I just got back from 10 days in Israel-Palestine, visiting religious sites and living communities. And as many of you know, Golgotha, or Calvary as it's called in Latin, is a site that you can actually go visit. You can head up a narrow flight of stairs just inside the doors of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, and you're there on what archaeologists believe was, in Jesus' time, a rocky hill just outside the city gates. Today it is part of this wild, messy, incense-infused church that is shared by seven different Christian traditions and visited by thousands of pilgrims every day. You can even bend down and touch the stone that for centuries has been venerated as the site of Jesus' cross. So yeah, we were just there. But that is not why we have this reading today from Luke's Gospel that feels supremely out of place in late November as we're beginning to turn our thoughts toward Advent and the baby in the manger. Today is Christ the King Sunday, sort of the Christian version of New Year's Eve the end of one church year, the annual hinge point in the turning of time. I think that pretty well explains the reading we have from the book of Colossians, that beautiful poetic passage that points to what we might call the cosmic Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That reading makes sense for the boundary between two years, doesn't it? As we mark time, we recall the one before time and through time and beyond, the one who holds it all together, the year that's past and the year to come. There's a sturdiness, a stability, an all-encompassing trust to that image that I think makes sense for the culmination of the year. But what then is the cross doing there? I suppose the easy answer has to do with all that kingdom language in the reading, including the criminal asking Jesus to remember him in Jesus' kingdom. Christ the king, kingdom, you get the idea. But even so, we have these two readings side by side, and they couldn't be more different. If Colossians feels like a firm rock beneath our feet, this little snippet from Luke, from the last hours of Jesus' life, feels like a flimsy board about to break. You can imagine standing on the first one, but what about the second? How are we supposed to stand on that? It's not only a question for us all these centuries later on Christ the King Sunday. Everything in this passage from Luke's Gospel seems to ask the same question. What kind of a king is this? Over the course of Jesus' life, his disciples had begun to get the idea that the rabbi they had been following around wasn't just an ordinary teacher, but was in fact the Messiah, the coming king whom the Jews had been waiting for for centuries. Uh, expectations of this sort were pretty high in Jesus' time. Many resented the Roman occupation and imagined that now might be the time when a new king would rise up from among the Jewish community and restore the people's dignity and freedom. The disciples watched the power and authority that Jesus commanded, and little by little the idea took hold. Maybe he's the one we've been waiting for, this one whom demons fear and crowds listen to. Maybe he is the coming king. Others clearly followed suit because when Jesus rode into Jerusalem at the end of his life, the crowds greeted him like a coming king, singing and throwing their garments in his path. But all those hopes have come crashing down by the end of this week. 
Now this supposed king is nailed to a piece of wood between two criminals, a not-so-subtle statement by the Romans on how they view those who might be plotting rebellion against them. If you're the king, save yourself, some of the, some of the onlookers shout. Others simply watch in silent grief or disbelief. The only person, in fact, who can imagine that this guy might still be a king of some kind is the criminal at Jesus' side. That's how bad things have gotten. And the claim made by Christians since the very beginning is that this human being is also the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Don't miss how strange that is. What an immense leap you have to make. The church here is on the side of the criminal, the one who, against all reason, looks at this human being who is alone, abandoned, and utterly powerless, and says, yes, the kingdom is present in him. We're not saying that once upon a time, God put on a human disguise for a while and then went back up into the clouds to be God. We're saying that God is really like that. That in the person of Jesus, and especially in Jesus on the cross, we see what God and God's kingdom is really like. Not exercising power by means of force and coercion and violence, but in a totally different way, in the way of mercy and love. We saw the site of the crucifixion on our pilgrimage to Israel-Palestine. But we also saw glimpses of God's kingdom that comes with that kind of power. And we saw it not so much in the dead stones as in the living ones, the people and communities of that place. We visited the International Center of Bethlehem, which is run by the Lutheran Church in that city of Jesus' birth. Angel, the woman who guided us around, and yes, she is a Bethlehem native with the given name Angel, she called the city an open-air prison today. Israel's occupation of the West Bank has crippled economic and social life for the inhabitants of this Palestinian city, turning the people into virtual captives in their own town. And in this open-air prison, the International Center has adopted the motto, the sky is the limit. They are helping young people to honor their community's traditions of dance and music and theater. They're teaching responsible civic engagement and nonviolent resistance. They're helping people imagine a better life for the future. That's the kind of power that Jesus shows. We learned about a group of young people from East Jerusalem who, as an act of resistance to the occupation, got the idea to organize the world's longest reading chain. They spread the news through social media and flyers and word of mouth, and on a recent springtime Sunday afternoon, 7,000 people showed up to form a chain around the city reading quietly to bring attention to injustice and human need. That's the kind of power Jesus shows. We spent an evening with two men, one Israeli and one Palestinian, who have each lost children to the conflict in that place. Rami, the Israeli man, lost a 14-year-old daughter to a bomb that exploded on a busy West Jerusalem street 20 years ago. Bassam, the Palestinian, lost a 10-year-old daughter to a stray bullet fired by a border guard. <clears throat> and they sat there in front of us, these two people who have every reason to be full of hate and bitterness and spite. And they spoke about healing. They spoke about how much alike they are, how they've experienced the same unspeakable pain and the same yearning for a better future. They told us how this alone has given meaning to their lives after the common loss they've endured, getting to know people on the other side and calling for an end to violence and the demonization of others. They described their work as putting tiny cracks in the walls that have been built up so that some light can shine through. I wish you could have felt the weight of their presence, these two fathers embracing each other against all odds how powerful it was to be around them. Because that's the kind of power that Jesus shows. In the middle of this terrific display of imperial power, of physical force that can roll right over a popular teacher and healer without so much as a pause, in the middle of that, Jesus displays something entirely different. 
Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, Jesus says from the cross. It doesn't look like power. For all the world, it looks like defeat. Only the criminal at Jesus' side seems to see something different. And in its better moments, the church sees it too, glimpsing God's deepest heart precisely there. That's the great leap of faith, and it changes everything. It changes what we see as truly powerful. It changes where we might look for God. It changes how we might act as people of that kingdom. Because if Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, then true power is found in mercy, in forgiveness that is freely given, in love that is followed all the way to its demanding end. It's that power that we sing here at the end of one year and the beginning of another, the power that bends to us in weakness, emptied, drawing near. May it put another crack in the walls around us, and may the light come shining through. Amen.